<sighs> Good morning. So uh, my name is Paul Ramsey. I'm from Boundless Geo. I'm a post just developer, but also now a, uh, a LiDAR point cloud developer. So for the, the first third of this year, I worked on building blocks for storing LiDAR data in PostgreSQL and then leveraging that data for analysis in PostGIS. So that means to do this, developing LiDAR types and functions in the database and then loading utilities to get the data into and out of the database. The development work's been largely funded by Natural Resources Canada. The first chunk of it was. Uh, they're planning on using PostgreSQL for uh, their database to store their national elevation data and national LiDAR inventories. So why would anyone want to put LiDAR in a database? What's the, what's the motivation for doing that? So first of all, you can't just stuff LiDAR point clouds into existing PostGIS types, like the point type or the multi-point type. There's, there's just too much of it, right? And a country can generate, a county, excuse me, can generate hundreds of millions of points. You know, a state will generate billions, a country will generate trillions. Second, uh, MITRE, LiDAR is multidimensional. And by multidimensional, I don't mean just X, Y, Z. A uh, uh, dozen or more dimensions, that's common for LiDAR per point, that's not unusual. And unfortunately, the multidimensionality of LiDAR is not fixed. It's not like there's always 12 or always 14. Sometimes you have four, sometimes you have 17. So you've got potentially billions of points uh, with many dimensions. You can't predict how many. So there's no way to stuff this stuff into existing PostGIS types or columnar tables. But we don't just want to say, oh, well, it's too hard because LiDAR point clouds, they have a geographic location. We can put the points into a place in space, which means if we can get them into a spatial database, then we can mash them up with other spatial stuff. Uh, and thanks to Tobler's law, which says everything is related to everything else, but near things are more related than, than distant things, um, we get some spatial value out of that. We can do spatial reasoning. So there's value in the exercise of doing it. On the other hand, uh, I am on the record as not wanting to put rasters in the database. And LiDAR point clouds share a lot of the features of rasters. Uh, LiDAR data isn't particularly relational. Um, this is a table definition for a sort of a standard feature, post feature table. It's got lots of interesting stuff. It's got geometries, but it also got lots of attributes, which can be joined to other things. To contrast, you know, a table of point cloud data looks like this. It's just a row of patch blocks. It's basically blobs in the database. There's not a lot of interesting stuff to query about there. And then LiDAR is really big, like billions and billions of points. So this is going to result in really huge tables that are kind of fiddly to manage. They're hard to back up in a database. They'd be far easier to manage on a file system. And finally, LiDAR is it's pretty static. You know, databases, they're built to handle constantly changing data. But LiDAR updates, they aren't, they aren't granular. You're not changing things a point at a time. You don't have continuous updates. They tend to be these big bulk updates, big overflies, just like raster data which means I need a little bit of re-motivation before I can keep going. So, void actually inside these rows and rows of binary blocks, there is actually quite a lot of detailed information, right? There's all these dimensions per point. And unlike raster, LiDAR use cases do tend to filter and subset the data. All these points get filtered and subset individually. So the use cases aren't just all about bulk retrieval. And finally, Tobler's Law is still there. So you've got the same motivation that got me to accept that raster is a useful thing in the database. It applies to LiDAR as well. Once you put it in, you can unlock all sorts of interesting analysis and value by having raster to vector, vector to raster, point cloud to raster, point, to point cloud to vector analysis going on inside the database. OK, so we've decided to do it. How do we store LiDAR in the database? First of all, we can't just go one point per row. Because if you have a table with billions and billions of rows, this is going to be too big to practically use. The index is going to be too big. The table size is going to be very large with one dimension per column. Uh, in general, there's a cost for a query iterating over per row. So we want to minimize that a bit. So what we do for storage is we organize the points into patches of several hundred to several thousand each. This reduces a table of billions of rows into a table of millions, which is a lot more tractable. So practically, for the implementation, we end up with two new types, uh, the po PC point type, one per point, and the PC patch type, which holds these squares, these collections of points. So the goal of LiDAR storage is to keep everything small because there's so much data. So we pack the data into a byte array. And for each dimension, we use as few bytes as possible to represent each value. So we can compare a packed form of a particular point. This has got an x, y, z, an intensity, r, g, and b values. 
packed into just 17 bytes. If you stored that same data using doubles for each value, you'd have 56. So even the, the fairly simple trick of packing things into the bytes saves you a lot of space. Once you pack them into a byte array, you need a description of that packing so you can unpack them to do analysis. So we have a description of how things are packed. It's done using an XML schema document. This is the same schema format that's used by the open source Poodle project that Michael's going to be talking about next. So this is just one dimension. This is the X dimension. And you can see uh, the scale and offset values. So this allows you to efficiently pack uh, large values into a narrower byte space. You can combine multiple dimensions in a single schema document that fully describes how a whole point is packed in. Each schema document is then stored in a row in the PC point cloud formats table, which assigns every schema a uh, spatial reference system and gives it a unique PC ID. So, to recap, um, we've got PC patches, which are collections of PC points, which are packings of dimensions which are described in XML schema documents which are stored in a point cloud formats table and it's all tied together with a PCID that relates patches and points to the schemas which you need to interpret them. So that's the, that's the, the developer's story. Does anyone recognize that? It's so what, so what, so what. You're not developers, you don't care about that. <laughs> Uh, what if you want to use it? What does it look like when you're using all this new software? Um, you want to enable it. So you build it. Post Point Cloud only runs on PostgreSQL 9.1 and up. Uh, so we support installation via the extension method. Create extension, alter extension, drop extension. So you enable the Point Cloud extension. Now you have Point Cloud. If you want to do spatial analysis with PostGIS, then you also enable the PostGIS extension. These two actually don't depend on each other. They're fully independent. In order to get the integration, you then add the uh, point cloud post just extension on top, which gets you the casts back and forth into the post just uh, domain. So you can do spatial analysis there. We've got a lot of tables and views in our database after enabling those extensions. Most of them are from post just. Uh, but there's two from point cloud, point cloud formats, which you mentioned, that holds the schema information, right? And then, like geometry columns, we got the point cloud columns view. So it looks into the systems tables and tells you which tables have point cloud columns in them. Now, before we can create any points or patches in our little example here, we need to have a schema that describes the dimensions that we're going to hold. So this is the one we're going to use. It's a simple four-dimensional schema. It's got an x, y, and z as 32-bit integers, and then an intensity as a 16-bit integer. And we're going to assign it a PCID number. All right, the top there, one. So you'll see the one show up. You know, you can see it. It's actually quite verbose. And this is just four dimensions. Um, so now we can create our table. We're just going to put, we won't do this um, for uh, operations, but for demonstration, we're going to create a table that has a PC point column. You'll only use points uh, transiently in operations. You use patches for storage. But we're going to make a, a point table here. Insert our first point in. We use the make point function. It lets you take an array of doubles and convert it into a PC point. You can see we're telling it that it's PCID 1, so it knows that this is 32-bit, 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 16-bit. And then we can select the point back out of the table. Ta-da! And we get a well-known binary format. Very well-known. See? Ta-da! Um, actually, it's not, if you break it out, it's not that crazy. Um, it looks a lot like the well-known binary format for geometries. We've got an Indian flag at the top. Got to have a PCID everywhere so we know how to interpret the rest of it. And then we've got our x, y's, and z's. It's little Indian, so the least significant stuff is out here at the front. And then finally, the intensity at the bottom. Um, so that's the computer-readable version. We also have an as text function, return something that humans can more easily interpret, or at least computers who think like humans. So rather than ape OGC well-known text for my as text, uh, I've just stuck with emitting JSON. It's more likely that people already have pre-existing JSON parsers to slurp that data down. You can pull any dimension out of a point using the dimension name. So this feature is the gateway for, uh, for filtering. So for any point, this is pulling z out, value is 34. If you've got the point cloud post, post just extension enabled, then you can cast your PC points over to post just points. So this is useful for visualization. All the visualizations later were done by casting my data from point cloud into post just and then visualizing it using QGIS. So taking the thing, cast it across, I get a point z. If we add one more point to our points tables, now we have a point with two tables in it, uh, we can make an aggregate. So first we add the second point, 
And then we can use this PC patch function. This is an aggregate function. It aggregates our two points into a single new patch in this new PC patches table. And then we can pull that one patch back out and see what the text representation is. The as text representation of the patch looks a lot like the point, except now we've got two point values inside our patch. So it's the world's smallest point cloud. Um, we did it. We did an aggregation with the PC patch function. We can do the opposite, an explosion, take a patch and blow it out into all of its component points. So exploding our patch back out and then taking the as text of those points, you see we get one row per point and the same values back. So there you go. Now you know how to use point cloud. So that's, that's the basics. Um, but when you're actually using it, yeah, you're probably going to use something more practical, like work with real data. So, so what about my SQL? Uh, in order to do real world stuff, we need to load real data. So we're going to use Poodle, the open source li uh, LiDAR processing tool, which can let us handle multiple input formats, although in this case, it's a last file, and multiple output formats, although in this case, it's the PostgreSQL point cloud format. And if you want to, you can also apply processing chains in the middle to muck with the data on the way through. So for the NRCAN project, I wrote a PostgreSQL point cloud driver for Poodle. That's now available in the Poodle main source repository. In addition to the reader and writer, we have to use a chipper, which takes the big input file and cuts it up into our small PC patch chips, which are suitable for database storage. So Poodle works on the idea of a, um, what, was it, what is this called? Oh, here, pipeline, a pipeline file, um, which defines the operations and the readers and the writers. So the readers go in the middle. We start by reading last. Then you've got your operations. Here's the ones we care about. We want to filter it, chipping it. In this case, we're chipping it into 400-point patches. And then we're writing up here to the point cloud. When the load's done, we've got a table like this. We've got a primary key and a whole bunch of patch data. And we can query it out and make sure it's the same as what we put in. Uh, confirm we've got all 12 million points by summarizing the number of points. And we've got 30,971 patches. And the result looks like this. It's kind of hard to see what's going on. But if you put it in the physical context, it's more interesting. It's Mount St. Helens. And if we look a little bit closer, <coughs> you can actually see the patch lines. So in this load, the chipper ensured that each patch holds about 400 points, though we could go higher. I'm um, up to about 600 points without patching, passing the PostgreSQL page size, which I consider a magic number. Uh, Michael and I are still going back and forth about what the most efficient patch size is. So it'll be fun to find that out and tell everybody what the right answer is. For now, we don't know. Um, so this is about Mount St. Helens. Mount St. Helens is an odd mountain, right? Because it doesn't have a nice pointy summit like most mountains do. It's got a rim right, uh, around the caldera. So we're going to answer an analytical question using Postgres point cloud. How tall is the rim of Mount St. Helens? So start that. Digitize the line. Got up my handy cue. Just digitize the line around the rim of the caldera. And what I'll do is I want to calculate the average elevation of this caldera rim. So here we go. It's a, it's a multi-step multi query. So I'm going to use my favorite um, PostgreSQL SQL syntax sugar, the with clause, which allows me to chain together a bunch of queries without having to nest them in a subquery so they can actually look at them sequentially. So first step, we get out our patches. We want to get all the patches that intersect a buffer of that rim geometry I just created. So that gives me the first chunk of data I'm going to process. So it gives me the raw data. Here's the patches that I get back out. And if you look in closer, you can kind of see what's going on. This is the path. Here's the buffer. Here's all the patches that intersected that buffer. So now given the patches, I'm going to take them and I'm going to blow them out, explode them into a set of points. So now I've got a great big uh, tuple set of points. And now I want to take them and filter them. So the points are coming in. I'm going to filter them and find just the points that fully intersect that buffer. So that's going to filter down the patches that were partly in the buffer and only leave behind the points that were fully in the buffer. So this is what's left, is these guys down the middle. And then the last step is to take those points and calculate the average elevation of all those. Ta-da, average count, there's our answer. So the average elevation of the rim of the Mount St. Helens caldera is 2,425 meters, um, which is problematic because the source of all truth in the universe says that the elevation of Mount St. Helens is 2,550 meters. 
So what's going on here? I cannot, I can't go against the source of all truth. Um, so let's do a little bit of extra analysis and visualization to figure out the discrepancy. Um, what we can do is explode all the points and patches and find just the points that are higher than an elevation threshold. So we'll find all the points in our Mount St. Helens area that are above 2,500 meters. Then we'll look at those in QGIS. And we start to get an idea. Aha, okay, so there's a tall bit over here. Uh, the rim isn't flat. The southern end is, is the tall bit, and then it sort of slopes downwards towards the north. And we can see that even more clearly by taking the patches. Uh, this is casting the patches across to post disk geometries. So when you catch a cast a patch, you get the square that surrounds it. Take those patches and color them thematically by their internal average point elevation. Then you can really see it. Uh, it's not just a nice even circle. In fact, it's quite tall over here and slopes downward as you head to the north. So there's a little practical analysis of PostgreSQL point cloud. So in order to lower the I.O. load, um, as you load this data into the database, uh, you want to keep them small, so you want to compress things. It's an important concern. The compression of a PC patch is no, there's not just one fixed compression. You can have several different ones. So the first compression, if you're going to have a multiple compression format, is going to be none. So all we do for the none compression is byte pack things. Uh, this is basically equivalent to a last file. Dimensional compression is the default compression right now. Uh, what dimensional compression does is it flips the, uh, the ordering of the data from point, point, point to dimension, 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 um, and then pig figures out the best possible compression for each dimension. Uh, you can pack 400 to 600 points into a single patch without going the page <laughs> over the page size. It's about a four or five times uh, compression compared to the uh, uncompressed value. And then we have a third one implemented right now in Nuri in the the third block is going to talk about this scheme, the geohash tree compression. That takes the points and sorts them into a prefix tree. So it drops a lot of um, bits, which are common to all the points. And then it also moves uh, data up to the point in the tree where it's common to all the children. So it's, it's both a compression and an ordering scheme. So it allows you to go into your patches fairly efficiently and pick bits out. We're still figuring out the most efficient way and effective way to use it, but it's a really cool trick. Um, I've shown a number of functions and actions, but the most important are probably uh, the get function, right, which allows us to interrogate points. Explode, right, that breaks the points into patches, or sorry, patches into points. Union goes the other way, uh, takes patches and builds them together into bigger patches. So this would be good for clip and ship output. Um, the patch function, which unions point sets back into patches. Intersects, so you can figure out which patches go together for particular geometry. And then really important, these casts back and forth to PostGIS. So you can take your point cloud data and push it across to the analytical side in PostGIS for things which aren't native implemented in point cloud. That was the only slide I had when I first presented this. Uh, we've now got even more functions. A lot of these are for speed. So you can now filter a patch, find all the values of a particular dimension that are less than a particular value. So threshold filtering is a really common use case in LiDAR. So less than, greater than, between values. And then it turned out that for efficiency, having the maximum, minimum, average values stored in the header of the patch, of the patch object made a lot of sense. Um, and then that this was a very common query. I want to find all the patches that have a threshold dimension higher or lower particular things. So we can get summary statistics for each patch as well. Future development, stuff that's going to happen over the next few months, uh, these two almost certainly transform. Right now, once you load your data into a particular schema, there's no easy way to flip it into a different schematization, either a different SRID or a different number of dimensions or a different scaling of dimensions without going out to Poodle, doing your scaling and changing and running it back into the database. Uh, so transform will allow you to do those kinds of operations inside the database. Intersection internally to a uh, point cloud will make their sort of classic geometry clipping thing a lot faster. And then really common use case, given a big point cloud, I want to see a raster visualization of it. So upsampling it into particular rasters. So this will be uh, an integration with PostGIS raster type. So you'll upsample things into PostGIS raster, and then PostGIS raster will let you move it out or do more raster stuff with it. The Poodle writer and readers are still very, very simple. Uh, and I think when they What's the word? <laughs> when they have contact with the enemy, which is to say the users, 
uh, we'll probably learn a lot about the extra, extra flexibility, extra functions that are needed to actually make it, use, make it useful in production. And then finally, I really feel like, although I, I tried really hard with uh, dimensional compression, I feel like there's smarter people out there who can do better compressions for sure. Um, probably not LASIP because we have um, unpredictable dimensionality, but something like LASIP that can handle arbitrary um, encodings of dimensionality, dimensionality would give us higher compression ratios for sure. Um, without, ha without having any data loss. So it's out there for real. You can get the source on GitHub for point cloud, uh, pull the latest poodle to get the point cloud drivers for reading and writing, and I'll take any questions for the next couple minutes. Yes, sir. Uh, um, I'm wondering uh, uh, up to which point this is uh, LiDAR specific, because I'm doing a lot of uh, reconstruction from uh, multi-angular satellite images, and I get basically point clouds, but they are not LiDAR clouds. So yeah, so to what extent is this LiDAR specific? Uh, it's not. If you have multi-dimensional data, you know, irregularly spaced yeah. samples, then, and uh, there's a lot of it, so it's then, like five formats and yeah, and yeah, if you get the right driver to read your format in, it'll go fine. Uh, the only place where it would might maybe not be a good fit is if they happen to be regularly spaced, in which case, hey, you have a raster. Yeah. <laughs> At the back. Do I have anything that works to well to do to extract, say, a surface model from a from a raw point cloud? I don't have anything that works to do that. Um, I think it'll probably be pretty far down the road uh, because I think uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, Michael. That tends to be fairly a very tunable operation. It's not an obvious sort of here's one parameter, do something to my data, it's 50 parameters of juggling and making sure you get the right stuff with lots of visual feedback. It feels like something that would be more likely implemented as third-party software reading from the database than right inside the database. Yes? You mentioned about uh, those patches. Is there any way to get those uh, extents of those patches out? Uh, I mentioned the patches. Is there any way to get the extents of the patches? Yes, I think. Uh, let's see. Objects, well, they're, they're objects with geometry in them. So, I mean, the dumb way is just to cast them over to, uh, to PostGIS. Mm. But um, I feel like I actually have extents functions in there, but yeah. I don't have the function list in my brain. <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah, I think it's, it's very trivial to get the extents out, either casting the PostGIS or I think there's direct reads on them. You're welcome. Thanks a lot, guys.